Cool. Um, th thank you, Pete, for the introduction, and hi, everybody. Um, so uh, I think this talk is kind of uh, part plea um, to, to everybody that this is kind of like an important topic uh, in data science. Um, and uh, kind of part kind of brief overview, uh, because I think it's a, a topic that kind of people have maybe shied away from a little bit uh, historically, because it is actually that it may be perceived to be quite difficult. Uh, but I think the message that I'm going to try and get across is that actually it doesn't have to be difficult, uh, and that there's some advances, uh, particularly in the last few years, which have uh, kind of come a long way in uh, helping us actually understand how to do causal inference in, uh, in data science. Um, so this, also, this talk also, I understand, may be not so appropriate for people who are not so much on the, on the data science side, maybe more on the data engineering side. So wh when it comes to the pleaing, I'm hoping that it transfers over. And if any colleagues that you talk to who are more on the building models, you can like, convince, after listening to this, you can convince them that uh, they need to think causally. So um, I know that there are lots of different ways of breaking down data science and breaking down machine learning and like thinking of how to split models. Um, one common way uh, is maybe into three buckets. Um, and like all good domains, data science has lots of different ways of saying the same thing. So if you don't necessarily recognize predictive explanatory optimization, you probably know it by some other terms as well. So predictive, explanatory or descriptive modeling, uh, optimization or maybe prescriptive modeling. But they're all essentially kind of interested in looking at like y equals fx, just with a different focus on maybe. So for predictions, we're interested to know uh, how to generate y's. For explanatory models, we want to look inside and understand what these relationships are, so understanding more about f. And optimization, kind of trying to find a good x. So kind of for this talk, uh, and for the causal inference in general, kind of I'm going to be talking more about the explanatory models. But I think kind of given that you can always use an explanatory model uh, for predictions as well. There may be certain domains in which kind of thinking about uh, causal inference for both predictive and explanatory models are important. And this is because uh, explanatory models drive key decisions. This can be within businesses. Um, it can be in very important domains like healthcare and things. So kind of whether this is just used for decision support, not necessarily just for making decisions, but it can, you know, it, it can uh, decide or help doctors decide who gets medication, who, who's most need. Uh, it can help uh, kind of companies improve themselves. So kind of if they want to look at their data historically and then perform interventions uh, and changes to their processes such that they improve, you, they do this by looking at explanatory modeling. Um, and so kind of like it's a, but it also only makes sense uh, if kind of like the models themselves uh, are, uh, make sense. And because we'd expect these explanations that uh, we'd get out of, a, uh, out, out of an explanatory model to, to make causal sense. So something that a human would understand. Uh, now, I was reviewing these slides last night and realized that I nicked them from a deck uh, that I uh, presented in London, and kind of like if you come from the northern hemisphere, this 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 slide kind of makes sense. If you come from the southern hemisphere or a country like Singapore with very very little seasons, uh, this is maybe kind of like not quite so uh, uh, appropriate a slide. But uh, obviously the idea that kind of you know ice cream causing forest fires is ridiculous, and then likely and also kind of you know ice cream being a diet food is also ridiculous. It's obviously driven by temperature, um, which uh, uh, I appreciate having moved to Singapore only about two months ago. Kind of seems to be putting seems to be staying pretty constant. Um, but kind of like if, a, if someone wanted to use the models that we're building in data science to make decisions based off, and they didn't see something inside that made causal sense, they would probably question it, right? There'd be a lack of trust. And so kind of like my plea is that, you know, we need to include causal inference because otherwise, you know, people won't use the models that we're building. They won't trust the models and it will become, you know, the, the famous phrase is obviously correlation is not causation. Um, and it's like some people in academia go even further than that and say kind of like, you know, well, if you're not actually considering causation at all, then you, know, you can't really do anything. Um, I'll come on to some of the more, uh, onto that a little bit later. In fact, actually, I've got a quote from one of the guys, guys at the bottom of this slide, Judea Pearl. Um, but so causal inference is a hot topic in data science. Uh, it comes in under a few other sort of um, names and um, you know th these are these are categories on their own, um, but there are definitely relationships between them. Um, so aside from just uh, wanting to build causal models uh, for 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 use in 
uh, in society. Um, counterfactual fairness is a big topic. Um, so kind of uh, the idea that you know maybe uh, there is some bias in the data that we're collecting, and then kind of this is going to have a knock-on effect to the models that we're building, uh, which could be essentially it's known as confounding, uh, could be kind of like uh, leading to biases. And so we want to make sure that when we're uh, actually building models that uh, uh, they, they are fair. And fairness is a very, I don't know how many people kind of uh, go to some of the, uh, the other big kind of ML AI conferences, but like fairness in the last few years has kind of definitely uh, been growing and growing and growing and not stopping. Um, there's also some close relationships to uh, reinforcement learning. So this idea, and this is to a lesser extent, but kind of the idea that um, when we're training, uh, RL is able to learn consequences uh, and it's able to learn what is going to make good interventions. Obviously, this doesn't quite kind of maybe generalize in the same way that we hope that a causal model would generalize. But there's uh, the idea that kind of this is not a, like a niche topic uh, on the fringes of AI and ML. This is actually something that, you know, actually relates into kind of other big research areas as well. So hot topic, but Unfortunately, quite a lot of machine learning uh, doesn't actually care about causality. I have this kind of like um, r rather contrived example where on the right hand side we're just generating some data uh, according to a system of equations or kind of like you can think of it as this graph. Um, and so we, we, know, we know what the answer should be basically if we, if we, if we look at the data generator on the right. Um, and the effect is that we want to, uh, sorry, the goal is that we want to find the effect of sun exposure uh, on somebody's illness. And so kind of like if we were to build a really, really simple model, so like, you know, only least squares, and we were to just add in one, one variable, uh, so just the, the, uh, the variable that we're interested in finding the effect of, so the exposure to sun uh, on illness, uh, we fit a model, it gets really poor performance, right? Um, but kind of if you look at the coefficient, um, it's actually very similar to, uh, to what we, uh, we know uh, is the true coefficient from the data that we generated. Yet if we kind of like add in more variables, um, we get a better model performance because the machine learning algorithm kind of is able to explain more variance overall. But it does this in a way that then kind of makes the, the meaning, the, so the coefficient, completely wrong for the, uh, for the variable that we're interested in. Um, and this is obviously very, very contrived and uh, it's, it's a bit of a paradox, but it's, uh, it's just to kind of like demonstrate and try to hit home the fact that, you know, quite often we don't know how the data was generated. Um, because in the real world, uh, we're not quite often uh, able to control uh, where we get the data from. It's kind of quite observational. Now, obviously, kind of um, in a perfect world, we might be able to kind of design how we get all of our data, and uh, you know, exist, this does exist. So things like randomized control trials, RCT data, um, mean, gives us the ability to kind of uh, unconfound almost by design. Uh, uh, what, the data that we then want to build models on top of. But obviously there's a lot of problems with RCT data, like, you know, kind of uh, A, it's, I mean, when this, when this does actually happen, it's normally quite small data. Um, there may be in some cases like ethical issues around actually putting some people in a certain group and other people in another group. So for instance, like in the medical domain. Um, and so it doesn't really scale. And so kind of, you know, um, quite often we are kind of forced to have to work with observational, uh, observational data. Um, or observational studies. And, but, you know, as I was saying, the problem is that this data was not generated with the, necessarily the, the, the question that uh, we have in mind. Um, so it might be highly confounded. The way the data has been collected may be really biased. And kind of the, if we build models on it blindly without actually thinking about these things, uh, there's some like serious risk that we could do something wrong. As is kind of like proven by the fact that, you know, Doing this stupidly, it can go. It can go really wrong, right? If we were to propose an intervention based on the second better model, better in inverted commas because it explains more variance, um, it would be wildly uh, uh, the coefficient of minus one would be wildly off from the the true coefficient of positive one. So I think there are two key challenges that we need to solve uh, when uh, working with observational data. Um, this is probably not an exhaustive list. I think that kind of um, uh, more academic people would, uh, than, than I would kind of say that there's far more problems. Uh, but the two big ones for me are finding the causal direction in this observational data um, and second, handling confounding. So, um, and then this is the, the more positive side of the, of, the, of the talk is about how 
uh, this has been like shied away from maybe uh, by people uh, in the data science community a little bit, but because it, it was maybe seen to be hard. I actually don't think that, I think there has been some, definitely a lot of progress in the last few years. And uh, I think kind of, you know, there are definitely some solutions, albeit not perfect solutions, but uh, things that we can do and should be doing to make sure that we are attempting to solve this as the best we possibly can. So on the first thing, um, around kind of identifying the causal direction from observational data. Uh, there's a number of recent sort of uh, what I would term kind of like uh, exploratory data analysis algorithms that have come out. So there's things like the RESIS algorithm, uh, the maximum likelihood estimation causality algorithm, uh, information geometric uh, causal inference algorithm. And then there is this one. This one was actually published at NeurIPS last year. Uh, it's based on kernel deviances, and um, I chose this one out of the others because they, they have a, a, a rather strange term. Uh, they, they try and claim that larger structural variability is a technical term, um, which I'll come on to explain in a second. Uh, but the idea is that like, if, you, if you take some observational data um, and you derive the conditional distributions from these observations, and then as you change the variable that you're conditioning on, um, in the causal direction, the distributions still can seem to make sense. But in the anti-causal direction, uh, they, have, they, they, they don't make sense. They have this larger structural variability. And the way that the, the authors of this paper are proposing that you then use this is that you can kind of calculate some sort of like Kolmogorov's, uh, Kolmogorov complexity of the distributions and say that, OK, if I've got lower complexity, this is more likely to be in the causal direction. And like, I'm putting like a big, big, big disclaimer on this because like, these methods are not perfect by a, by a long stretch. Nothing is perfect. We, obtaining causality from this sort of data is definitely 100% not fully possible. A big, big disclaimer. But it can help. Um, so kind of like the way that we use this uh, uh, in, in my role is that we use this as a first pass. Uh, we kind of say, okay, if this is a domain that we don't necessarily understand, or this is a process that is like really highly technical, and we need we need some help basically in understanding what's going on, uh, we apply these algorithms. They give us a good first pass. Um, they make us sound slightly less stupid when we go talk to the client, um, and then we. Uh, but the important thing is that we do go talk to someone because at the end of the day, understanding causality from this sort of data is only kind of um, uh, only possible if you really understand the processes going on, and like you, we do still need expert help. So kind of like finding a method to kind of uh, give you a first pass is great, uh, but then the important step is going and getting some expert help um, to uh, to understand properly what the causal uh, direction is, and then this then I guess you could argue that all of your causal models are only kind of, um, kind of an expert's opinion of causality. But you know, this, even the fact that we're thinking about this and the fact that we're making the effort to, to kind of like make sure that uh, we go away and study it is kind of like a step in the right direction. I think um, like there is slightly more, uh, definitely more work has been done on kind of uh, how to assess confounding. The problem is when it comes to how to assess confounding is that people have very varying views. Um, so there's kind of like two different schools of thought uh, which don't really like talking to each other. In fact, um, if you ever look at Judea Pearl and uh, uh, Rubin's uh, stuff, they, like, they really like arguing with each other and they've been doing this like since the 90s. Um, but kind of, um, again, there is no perfect way. I'm not claiming that you know, there is one right way of doing these things. Um, but the idea is that, I mean, taking the right-hand side of the slide uh, to start with, um, if we can get out of having to handle confounding, that's the easiest way by far. But if you find yourself into a situation where you really do have to, uh, to handle confounding, then um, some people use uh, propensity score matching. Uh, some people use, so uh, Susan Athey uh, has published lots of papers on causal forests. So there's, so there's some kind of like quite complicated, still black boxy models which are claiming to be able to handle uh, confounding. Um, but then, uh, and the, the topic that I want to talk about the most because it's, it's my academic background and it's the thing that I kind of like um, force all my colleagues to use at QB um, is um, Bayesian networks. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about structural equations because they, they to start with, they, um, they, they kind of relate to each other in the way that what we're really looking to do is we're looking to augment the models using expert help. And so kind of like some people can be a little bit allergic to this because they can be like, oh, but you're baking in assumptions. Well, yeah, sure, but like all data science is baking in assumptions. If you apply a linear model, you're baking in the assumption that all of your features are independent. 
I almost guarantee that that's not going to be the case. Kind of like, you know, we have to make some assumptions somewhere. And kind of like, if we can like stick to a framework that um, allows us to be very, very transparent about the uh, about the assumptions that we are building in, then that's 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 still fine, right? Your, your model is only kind of valid up until your assumptions that you're making. And so kind of like uh, going to an expert and finding a method that allows you to uh, help uh, encode causality, I think is still valid. So um, taking, I don't know why I designed all these slides so that you have to look at the right hand side first and then the left hand side. I think I need to work on my uh, slide making skills. Uh, but so if you take the right hand side first, because I want to talk about Bayesian networks in more detail, um, kind of, and look at the structural equations. Um, so kind of like, you know, this, this is a very simplistic way, right? It's, it's probably like very, quite old hat way um, of kind of like someone maybe sitting down thinking about some sort of dynamical system that they could design that mimics the process. A smarter way, in my opinion, um, and I'm a little bit biased, is using kind of uh, an approach known as Bayesian networks. Now, Bayesian networks are, if, if people haven't come across them uh, before, there's, a, there's an example at the bottom. Uh, they are directed acyclic graphs. And essentially, they are kind of ways where you can think of every node is, uh, as a feature or your target. And they are kind of uh, trying to capture the interdependencies between the variables that exist in your data. So kind of like the assumptions that get, uh, that get baked in is that uh, um, where there is an edge between the nodes, there is a conditional dependence. And everything that doesn't is conditionally independent from, uh, from one another. Um, but the reason why I like these um, is that kind of uh, when we learn them, there is a step in the middle where we can learn a structure. A domain expert can come in and add in their input, and then we can go away and fit the probabilities. And the, this is actually quite unusual for lots of machine learning models. There, there aren't many models where you get to step in in the middle and kind of uh, edit what's going on and help, and help the model basically uh, get more causal. But they, they are kind of um, a little bit sidelined for a long time. Um, primarily because they were very computationally demanding. Uh, so actually, the, the learning of a structure uh, is, has been seen as like a very, very difficult problem. Um, there's, a, there's a few different methods of doing it. So you can do it based on constraint-based methods. You can do it based on score-based methods. You could even forget about the whole using data to learn the structure and uh, just ask a domain expert to come up with a structure for you and then fit the probabilities. Um, but uh, last year uh, at, at NeurIPS as well, um, some academics came out with a new, new paper. And I will talk very, very briefly about the maths, if I'm allowed. Uh, yeah, OK, on the next slide, um, about, about that, and because I think it's super cool. I, I won't go into too much detail on it. Um, I know I'm a little bit of a boring nerd, but um, kind of, uh, it's, it's meant that kind of this big, uh, this big uh, blocker to using BNs, like the actual structural learning process, has kind of been eroded away a little bit. Um, and as I mentioned, kind of like this hybrid approach, where kind of like we maybe like let the model learn a structure from data to start with, get a first pass, expert comes in, adjusts the edges, says, you know, actually, I think this link that is, the data has found is spurious. Maybe the data that was collected was, you know, biased, and uh, we should remove it. Or maybe I think there is a, a link here to be made. Maybe there was a weak link, but kind of the algorithm didn't think it was important. Maybe there wasn't enough data, but I can add it in. Um, and also, we can change the direction. So if, if, the, if the structural learning algorithm picks up the, uh, the wrong direction, um, something causes something the other way around, uh, then we can fix that as well, as long as we don't introduce uh, a cycle. And then once we've, once we've fit a Bayesian network, everything else kind of like just flows like a regular uh, machine learning model. So we can check our model performance. Um, kind of if we're going to think about the, the question we're trying to answer is like, how do we build explanatory models? Obviously, explanatory models tend not to be the most complicated things in the world because we want them to be interpretable. Um, so, but BNs, because they're able to capture these interdependencies between the variables, they don't make these assumptions, like a, say, like a linear model that everything's independent. Uh, they're able to normally outperform other uh, simple models. Um, and then we're able to perform inference on them. So we can essentially query the network. And um, Judea Pills came, came up with a system of being able to also implement interventions as well. So kind of performing counterfactuals using Bayesian networks. I'll give you, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in a, in a, a couple of slides. Um, but hopefully you'll allow me to geek out for a little bit and just talk, talk you through. If no one's seen this paper, this is one of like the best papers that I've, I've seen uh, at Neurips for like a while. And, it, and I say this because it's so simple, like really, really simple. And it solved like a big, big problem um, that 
uh, was a blocker to using Bayesian networks. So if you, like, if you think of like structuring a, a, a way of describing these edges between the nodes, think of it as a matrix. So this is known as an adjacency matrix. And the big, the big difficulty in learning uh, in the structure learning algorithms for a BN was actually checking that there was no cycles. So, which is like, you know, quite a simple thing, right? Acyclicity. Except that um, this, was, this was stopping, stopping people from using continuous optimization algorithms. And what the authors realized was that actually, the only thing that you need to check is that you need to check the adjacency matrix when multiplied by itself again and again and again and again and again, as for up to, you know, uh, well, technically only up to as many uh, powers as you have nodes in the graph. But as long as the, uh, the, the diagonal continues to be zero, you're not ever going to introduce a cycle. And kind of like, you know, a matrix, uh, kind of, and then the matrix to the power two, matrix to the power three, matrix to the power four, et cetera, et cetera. This starts to look a lot like, just like in the exponent of the matrix. And essentially, they were able to introduce this system where kind of like, just by checking the trace of the exponent of the matrix, uh, they were able to confirm that there are no cycles in the graph, uh, which is so simple. It's like, uh, but it's not been thought of for like 25 years. So um, I think that's super cool. Um, and then the, the author is uh, also a super, super cool guy who uh, is keen to work with anyone in, this, in industry as well, because basically uh, the problem for quite a lot of academics is that they don't have data. And so kind of like, if you, if you ever reach out to him, he's super cool to talk about uh, how to, uh, how he can use his methods and how he can learn from industry as well. And so actually, kind of, just to give a very, very, very illustrative example, because I appreciate I've been talking a lot about um, theory things and kind of like not giving any concrete things. Um, this is, but <laughs> I say no concrete things and then say this is illustrative. Um, so kind of, I just wanted to give an example of the sort of network that we're able to build for uh, decision support in, um, in pharma world. So kind of like this is something that I, I built in, in January. Um, it's wrong on purpose because I'm afraid I'm not allowed to share the actual thing. Um, but kind of like it's, it's in, relatively indicative of how kind of like we can take all of these different diseases. So this was learned off some uh, insurance data um, and it's kind of like trying to work out what the risk of a uh, myocardial infarction, which basically just means heart attack, uh, is for having different diseases. And so, like, I just want to like pull out a few key features of what the, using a Bayesian network would uh, will give to you. Um, so, first, it's these relationships between the diseases. It's not just the relationship between uh, the uh, diseases and a heart attack. It actually kind of like you can tell a story, and you can kind of you can see how. So, say, smoking causing obesity, obesity causing diabetes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of the as a, just to repeat. Um, some of these le links won't make sense on purpose, uh, but kind of like, you know, it means that it, it helps garner trust with the people who are using these models in the end, which if they can see inside it, it's interpretable, right? You, you can see these things, you can see how they connect to each other, um, and you can see how kind of like they causally could drive each other. Um, then we get to get some metrics out of these things. So we get to see that uh, we can test the sensitivity of uh, either the, uh, the different variables amongst themselves. So this is denoted by the, the thickness of the edges, basically. Um, or you can, see, you can test the sensitivity to the target that you're interested in. In this case, uh, an MI, or heart attack, myocardial infarction. And kind of like, these are super powerful more generally as well, because um, we, if you think about putting this into like a business setting, um, say some of these features are levers that you are able to pull or like things that you're able to intervene on in your business. Um, if you're able to see what has uh, very sensitive edges, these could be like really quick, easy wins that you could, if you make a change, it's going to have some impact. Whereas kind of th things where, you know, there's a very weak edge and actually if you change something, there's not going to have a lot of effect. You might kind of go, okay, maybe this is a process that's not worth changing. Um, so you can see how this might generalize to, um, to uh, the business world more generally. But kind of like in, in, uh, in this specific example with the, uh, the pharma case, kind of like because we can then query the network, uh, underneath, all, underneath all of these nodes, there are essentially uh, probability distributions and kind of like they are conditioned on their parents. So kind of like as we kind of add evidence or as we add observations to the data, it's Bayesian, so it updates. So you update to get a new posterior. 
Um, and then you can kind of like see, okay, maybe we could use this to help a, a clinician kind of work out the risk profile for someone uh, of having a certain disease. We can give it certain different criteria. So we can say, okay, at one point the patient is a smoker. We know that uh, we know what their BMI is. We know how old they are. They have a certain disease. They have a, a, an increased above average uh, risk of having a, a, a myocardial infarction. And we can see that kind of the, you know as we query this in different ways, uh, the, the likelihoods change and the the, the probabilities update uh, and tell uh, and give us like very easily interpretable results. And kind of like to go back to the generalizing, generalizing of this. Essentially, this is this is how we kind of think about all of our uh, explanatory projects uh, uh, at QB. Is that we we want to take our historical data, and we want to kind of like train a model, and then we want to think about okay, what are the business interventions that we want to make? Uh, we want to shift the data to kind of say okay, um, what uh, what if we did make these changes? And then we want to see what the value of making these changes would be before we actually get the business to do it. Uh, because otherwise, if we're wrong, then that could be a very expensive mistake. And uh, then we're able to get the value at stake. The, this, uh, this only works, though, if the model that we trained is actually causal. Because if, if we're making an intervention and it wasn't causal, then we'd be getting it potentially totally, totally wrong. So our what-ifs could be very, very inaccurate. So this is my point about it being uh, very important that we think about causality early on, or we get as close to it as we possibly can. So just to recap, because um, I was always told, tell people what you're going to say, say it, then tell people again what you said. Um, so apologies that I'm uh, repeating. But kind of, if we want to make decisions based on ML, then we should expect these ML models to make causal sense. Um, unfortunately, the data that we actually have to work with is more often than not always going to be observational. Um, uh, because like, getting RCT data is just very, very difficult. Um, whilst people have like, shied away from it a little bit um, historically, um, there are now methods getting more common that will help us to identify these causal relationships. Um, and models that like, respect causality or respect a domain expert's view of causality exist. And thanks to these like, recent advances in the structure learning, uh, are now easier to actually learn uh, and deploy. So thank you very much. I think I actually made it on time. Excellent.